The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. LinkedIn presents. In any age of rage, free speech is often the first victim. What few today want to admit is that they like it. They like the freedom that rage affords, the ability to hate and harass without any sense of responsibility. It's evident all around us as people engage in language and conduct that they repudiate in others. We have become a nation of rage addicts. What's up, people? Today is Thursday. My name is Michael Kovnat, and this is the Next Big Idea Daily. Do you believe in free speech? Do you really? I mean, the right is enshrined in our Constitution, but it has been controversial from the beginning, with some opinions considered too dangerous to air publicly. But at a time when outrage seems to be the air we breathe and misinformation the coin of the realm, we need some new agreements on the freedoms and responsibilities involved in speaking our minds. Here with some guidance is Jonathan Turley, author of The Indispensable Right, Free Speech in an Age of Rage. Jonathan is a law professor at George Washington University, a columnist, television analyst, and litigator. Here he is to share a few of his big ideas. We are living in an age of rage. It permeates every aspect of our society and politics. Rage is liberating, even addictive, It allows us to say and do things that we would ordinarily avoid, even denounce in others. Rage is often found at the furthest extreme of reason. For those who agree with the underlying message, it's righteous and passionate. For those who disagree, it's dangerous and destabilizing. Thomas Jefferson would tell James Madison that, quote, a little rebellion now and then is a good thing. Rage rhetoric is the ultimate stress test for a system premised on free speech. It is a test that we have often failed. The rage of dissidents has produced rageful responses from the government. It is state rage. We have a right to rage. It's rageful acts, not speech alone, that the state should punish. Yet in any age of rage, free speech is often the first victim. What few today want to admit is that they like it. They like the freedom that rage affords, the ability to hate and harass without any sense of responsibility. It's evident all around us as people engage in language and conduct that they repudiate in others. We have become a nation of rage addicts, flailing against anyone or anything that stands in opposition to our own truths. Like all addictions, there's not only a dependency on rage, but an intolerance for opposing views. As discussed in this book, our Constitution was written not only for times like these, but in a time like this. Free speech is a human right. It is the expression of thought that is the essence of being human. Free speech is often justified in what I call functionalist terms. It is protected because it is necessary for a democratic process and the protection of other rights. That is certainly true. Brandeis's view of the right as indispensable was due to the fact that most rights are realized through acts of expression, from the free press to association to religious exercise. However, it is more than the sum of its practical benefits. It is the natural condition of humans to speak It is compelled silence or agreement that is unnatural. That is why it takes coercion or threats to compel silence from others. We rarely teach the philosophy of free speech to young students. Natural and autonomous theories tie free speech to a pre-existent or immutable status. As such, it is not the creation of the Constitution, but rather embodied in that document. One of the most influential philosophers for the framers, and a host of later philosophers like Voltaire, was John Locke. 
In 1689, Locke described a, quote, state of nature and presented his labor theory of property as a natural right that flowed from a divine gift to create. Humans are themselves creators with a common need to express themselves in the world around them. Putting aside the desire to procreate as itself an act of creation, the desire to create objects or expressions is irresistible for most people, from the simple act of doodling to the construction of the Great Wall of China. It is seen in the drawings in the French caves from 17,000 BCE to the graffiti on the walls in New York City in the 21st century. Creation is the expression of ourselves, the projection into the world of our values and visions. What makes us human is obviously a subject heavily infused with subjectivity and religiosity. How we view humanity depends on how we view the potential and position of humans. Like other animals, we procreate, we experience pain and pleasure. We share chemical, muscular, and emotive impulses, just as other animals. We share 98.7% of our genetic sequencing with great apes like chimpanzees and bonobos. Does that make us more conversant, less hairy apes? We also share 80% with a cow and 61% with a fruit fly. There is even a 60% overlap with a banana. The effort to distinguish a human from a banana is easy with comparisons from color to complexity. However, it is easier to explain why we are not a banana than it is to explain what makes us human beings. Humans are more than talking bananas, despite our shared genetic sequencing. To be human is to create, and these creations are a form of speech. Under this view, whether it is a column or a cake or a cathedral, creation is a quintessentially human act. George Bernard Shaw once said that, quote, a reasonable man adjusts himself to the world. An unreasonable man expects the world to adjust itself to him. Therefore, all progress is made by unreasonable people. Like many of the free speech figures discussed in this book, Anita Whitley was that brilliantly unreasonable person. Like many radicals in the period, Whitney was wrong for all the right reasons. She saw desperate poverty and wanted to end it. Whitney believed that there was an inalienable right to free speech that belonged to all citizens. Quote, a real American cannot be blamed for demanding freedom of opinion and freedom of speech. It's in the blood. Whitney was right. However, on November 29, 1919, Whitney prepared to give a speech at the Oakland Center of the California Civic League. The police originally canceled the speech because she was declared a woman of, quote, known political tendencies. A compromise was reached that would allow her to speak, but only if she consented to having an American flag on the stage and a police officer. As she walked on stage with the officer looming near her and other officers in the crowd, Whitney had to know that she was about to give the government what it was waiting for. Whitney denounced the lynching occurring around the country, and she was promptly arrested. The jury deliberated just six hours and found Whitney guilty. The case would become famous for its concurrence by Justice Brandeis, in which he declared free speech to be indispensable. Brandeis states that free speech is both an end and a means under our Constitution. However, the rest of the discussion suggests a narrower and likely more intended meaning. Brandeis rattles off the classic functionalist purpose of free speech to enable citizens to seek change and perfect the democratic system as a whole. Free speech is, quote, indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth and, quote, to discuss grievances and propose remedies. There is no question that he is correct. Free speech does all of that and more in protecting other rights and other citizens in our system. However, the focus on that democratic function lends itself to balancing tests based on the value of given speech within that functionless construct. In Douglas Adams' 1979 science fiction novel, 
The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Deep Thought, a supercomputer, is asked to answer, quote, the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. After 7.5 million years of calculations, Deep Thought finally reveals the answer to the meaning of life. 42. Deep Thought's answer was a brilliant commentary on macro theories that seek to explain life's mysteries and our tendency to search for a single, unifying answer to complex questions. Free speech itself is both simple and complex. In the act of free speech, nothing is more straightforward. Likewise, the denial of free speech is often as plain as a gag or a ban. However, free speech is more than the act of speech, and its denial is more than the act of an arrest. If free speech is a human right, the exercise or abridgment of that right transcends the specific message or context of the expression. At the risk of being trite, free speech is not about perfecting democracy. It's about perfecting ourselves. It is part of an individual's interaction with the world and other people. The restoration of free speech values will require a clarity and conviction that has long evaded our country and our courts. At the founding, many were drawn to a natural rights basis for free speech in the writings of John Locke, who stressed inevitable rights that included the freedom of thought. While it is not an absolute right, it is not simply a right used for democratic purposes. A natural or liberty-based right avoids the sand trap of functionalism, where speech becomes less protected depending on its inherent contribution to participatory or democratic values. The trade-offs become greater the further you move away from the speech used to advance political change or causes. This can lead to a greater content-based series of judgments on what speech should be favored or disfavored. The erosion of free speech will continue until we embrace an autonomy-based concept of free speech. While it is a bit much to claim an answer as succinct or complete as 42, it is possible to define the outer limits or framing of the answer for this quintessential right. Free speech demands bright lines. Ambiguity and uncertainty are its death knells. The absence of clarity on the use of the right is what drives the chilling effect where citizens self-censure rather than risk sanctions for speech. That clarity is offered in the harm principle of John Stuart Mill, who articulated a limited view of government action. Under that principle, quote, the sole end for interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number is to prevent harm to others. Mill defined the legitimate scope of government powers protecting citizens from the harms of others, but that did not generally include protecting them from harmful ideas. There is one great advantage to believing in a natural or autonomous basis for free speech, a certain optimism. The current anti-free speech movement cannot entirely change us. We are hardwired for free speech with a psychological, even a physiological impulse to create. If you believe that free thought and expression are the essence of being human, that impulse cannot be entirely extinguished. While we can lose our appetite for free speech, we can never truly lose our taste for it. In the end, our faith in free speech is really a faith in each other. So this is indeed an age of rage. However, rage is not what defines us. It is free speech that defines us. Thank you, Jonathan. Well, we here at the Next Big Idea Club have not lost our appetite for free speech. In fact, we celebrate it every day by sharing the best new ideas from the latest nonfiction. You can follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, or X, and you can find our newsletters on Substack or LinkedIn or you can take a look at everything we have to offer at nextbigideaclub.com. Check it out. I'm Michael Kovnett, and I'll see you tomorrow.